Our guest, please welcome them, Alistair Darling. Good evening. Hello. I don't know how to start, really, except to say this, that um, you must realise that there are many people who say, OK, we might be a little bit poorer. Life might be a wee bit difficult. But we still want to live in a Scotland that's independent. What do you say to them? Well, look, I accept that there are people living in Scotland who believe, as a matter of principle, that Scotland should be a separate, independent state from uh, the rest of the United Kingdom. And for people who believe that, then there's probably not much I can do to shift them. They're equally, beyond your ken. Well, equally, on the other side, you will get people who fervently believe, you know, just as strongly, uh, that we are part of the United Kingdom, we're British and Scottish, and, you know, their minds are probably made up. And... You know, in the, this stage in the referendum, though, it, the thing that we, both sides are pretty focused on is there's rather a large number of people in the middle who say, well, I don't know yet. You know, I, I'm yet to be persuaded by either side. Now, our job clearly is to motivate those people who, like me, um, I am Scottish, I'm proud of being Scottish, I live here, my family grew, grew up here, but I just happen to think that we are better and as a country, we're better as being part of the United Kingdom. I've got to try and convince a majority of people. And the thing that weighs, I suppose, most heavily in my mind is that this is not like a general election where you can vote in a party of government, and if you don't like them, four or five years later, you can vote them out. This time, if the nationalists win by one vote, that's it. There's no going back. And that is why the stakes in this are so much different and so much higher, I would argue, than a normal election, if you like. But, you know, we're six months to go, um, just over under 200 days to go, and I'm very conscious of the fact there's probably a million people in Scotland who have yet to make their mind well, up. Well, I was going to ask you for a figure, and you've sort of given it. Is that an accurate figure? We're talking about a country of, what, five and a half million people. How many people do you think uh, are there holding the key to this vote in September? Well, look... Nobody can be absolutely sure no. because polling's polling sure, and, sure. and you have to take it with the usual yes. bucket loads of salt and all the rest of it. Um, but Scotland's got an electorate of about four million. Yes. Uh, and I think it's common ground. There's probably about a million out of that four million whose votes are still up for grabs. A million. It, could, it could be that some of them are saying, well, actually, I'm not telling you because you're a politician and I don't believe you and, and I'm not going to say. Yes. Um, or it could be they genuinely don't know. Uh, but I know certainly from, you know, our experience, there is a lot of, there's a lot of people in Scotland who still have to make their mind up, and they are the ones, never mind the opinion polls at the moment, if you look at the headline figures, you know, from my point of view, that, you know, OK, it's better to be in front than behind, but I'm very conscious of the fact that when you drill down beneath that and you ask people, well, what makes you decide which way you're going to vote? It, you know, there's arguments of the head, there's arguments of the heart, there's arguments of both, but there are, there's still a huge amount to be done. And, you know, this referendum campaign, you know, six months to go, you know, it could go either way. So you think it's one in four of those who have a vote have probably not made up their minds? Yes, there's a lot. And what will decide them? Well, if you look at this, if you ask people, you know, if you like, the, the, the undecideds yet, um, I think it, it is a mix of an emotion, which are people who say, you know, I love Scotland, I love my country... The most common thing we get back is people say, but there's so many unanswered questions. You know, what currency we would we use? Um, what would happen, I mean, like this week, for example, when you see that you get a shock to the system, a sudden drop in revenues from oil taxation. I mean, if, if, was, if we were independent today, the Scottish finance minister would be faced with a drop of income equivalent to everything we spend on Scottish schools, about £4 billion. And he would either have to start cutting spending or putting up taxes, or probably both. Which, you've, which you've done in your time. What, what I do know in my time 
and I think you alluded to it in the start, if you're the Chancellor of the Exchequer of the UK and you have a budget of £700 billion, actually, although it's irritating to lose £4 billion, you can deal with it not too, without too much difficulty. But going back to what you were saying earlier, there have been two, two events in the last five years that would perhaps illustrate why I, as a passionate Scot, believe that we're better and more stronger together. One is the banking crisis, when Tom McKillop said to me, we're running out of money, and he said, what are you going to do about it? It's interesting to ask me what I was going to do about it, since he was paid to do that himself. And what you did about it was 80 billion. Well, yeah, I, well, our RBS consumed a mere 50 at that time. Yes, yes. But, but, but the, the point was, start. when he said to me, we're running out of money, and I said, well, how long can you last? And he said, well, maybe two or three hours. I could, <laughs> well, he did say this, I could do something about it, even though at that time, RBS was the biggest bank in the world. And actually, if you look at the size of RBS... Hmm? Sort of theoretically. Well, it, for a, yes. a few hours later yes. that day, it wasn't. Um, but it was bigger than the American banks. But because it, you know, it was about the same size as our total GDP, our total income or, or wealth, if you like, when Ireland was confronted with the same problem, Ireland went bust, and it had to go to the IMF from the European Union, similarly with Iceland. Now, let's hope that you don't get another banking crisis, but we're very foolish to, hope, to, to believe it won't come again. But if you take what happened this week, which is all too predictable, when you've got revenue, an independent Scotland where about 20% of its revenue is coming from the North Sea, we know it's in long-term decline. You know, it's got some way to go yet, but it's in long-term decline. But what we also know is the prices are not, tax revenues are notoriously volatile. So if you suddenly find you've lost as I say, the equivalent of what you spend on all Scottish schools, in one year, if you're a small country, it's not that you can't cope with it, but you do then have to take some pain and trying to deal with it. The alternative, of course, is to spend many years not spending as much as you're spending or increasing taxes in order to run a greater surplus. Well, uh, but either way, what you can't do is you can't face a loss like that without consequences. And that's why I just think we are, you know, we, we are far better and stronger to pool and share those resources when you get shocks to the system, either like the oil shock this week or the longer term one like the ageing population, for example. Right. Well, I've led you, uh, let you make that point at, at some length. Fair enough. But let me ask you a question. Um, if it were a yes vote, um, you're still an Edinburgh MP. Uh, you've got constituents there. If there were a yes vote and the argument came up about the currency, and we know that uh, what Alex Hammond's preferred option is, is sterling currency union, we know that George Osborne and Ed Bowles and uh, Danny Alexander have said it won't happen, you would then have to represent your constituents in getting the best deal... You wouldn't like the result of the referendum, but you'd have to help them. What would you fight for on behalf of your constituents? Well, look, let's deal with the currency union, first of all. I don't think it's in Scotland's interest any more than it's the rest of the UK's interest, which is why it won't happen. Uh, and I, it's worth just saying why, then of course I'll yes, answer your okay. question. Um, one, the first is, the two economies will be very, very different. One, 90% of the current the UK's GDP, one, 10%, slightly less than 10%. Uh, like Scotland, very heavily dependent on oil revenues. The UK is a more broadly based economy. The thing will be inherently unstable, as a number of experts have been saying in the last few weeks. The second thing is that a currency union, and this is the Eurozone shows that, only works if you've got economic and then political union. That's why the Eurozone, they're having to agree each other's budgets. So we'd be in a situation where we're locked into a currency union in a legal straitjacket, being told what to do by, you know, a large country next to us. Anton Muscatelli, who's a distinguished economist and principal of Glasgow University, says he thinks it could work. He, what, what he said was the advantages of a currency union and everything that underpins it, um, like what we've got at the moment is a good thing, but you, to make it work, you need to have an economic and political union underneath it. I mean, Mark Carney's lecture, and you know, he didn't take sides when he came to Edinburgh no. uh, six or seven weeks ago, he made the point that if you look at the currency unions around the world that work, like uh, you know, in the United States or Canada, they work because you can transfer large sums of money if you need to around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, you, can, you can underwrite the banking system around the country, which you have to do from time to time, but you can't do that unless you're part of the same political union. The Eurozone is not working because it doesn't have that political union. Look at the problem just now where Germany will not sanction transferring funds to the poorer southern Mediterranean countries. Uh, 
uh, in a way that needs to be done. So, I mean, I, I just don't think it's going to happen. I actually think the real problem that the Scotland will have is having to reapply to join Europe. I have dealt, I've been to European ministerial councils for 13 years, and they're tedious things. Honestly, you could join UKIP halfway through them, if, uh, you know, at yes. times. Uh, although... That's a story. It is. Look, let, let, me, let me say Do that... Do you want you, to just clarify that? Yeah. The, the antidote is to meet someone from UKIP, and then you realise that actually that the right. European Union is a jolly good thing. Sorry to the Herald, but it's not quite Sorry, the story. Sorry, I've just killed your story. To be um, but, you know, I, one of the things I'm very conscious of is that nobody has got into the European Union since the Eurozone was set up without having to undertake to join well, the Eurozone. Well, the, the argument that the Scottish Government make is, is the Swedish case. Now, we know that Sweden that joined in... They the Eurozone. Yeah, 1995. Uh, but, but nonetheless, they say, look, this is a model that could happen. Why not? Be because I think things have moved on since 1995. Uh, the Eurozone was set up in 1999. Um, and the, the European Union, is, it's, it's, never mind what the law says, it's an intensely political organisation. And remember, you're dealing with a situation where 27 other member states can veto your application on whatever ground they want. But the, the Spanish foreign minister said that, uh, you know, people have raised the Catalonian question with him. And he said, look, if there was a democratic vote in the UK, we would have no problem with it. We wouldn't interfere. <laughs> what he said was they wouldn't interfere with the vote, and quite yes. rightly yes. so. He did not say, and by the way, if we have that, we'll let you in without any trouble. And, you know, never mind Spain. And I can't lose count of the number of negotiations I was at where I thought I was dealing with, say, employment law, only to discover that unless we agreed somewhere else to changing the olive oil regime, that someone was going to block the employment changes. The problem with the European Union, and it's inevitable, I suppose you've got 27 you know, member states there, is yeah. any one of them can block it for whatever reason they want. And that's why, you know, if I stand back from all this, we, what, what, I, what I want is a country, Scotland, that can freely trade into the rest of the UK without any currency problems, don't have to change our money north and south of the border, but it is underpinned by an economic and political union. And Jim, I can't think of a country anywhere in the world where a country is left a union, and then there's a currency union. I understand the point of getting into a currency union okay. on your way to closer union, but if you're actually travelling in the opposite direction, um, I just don't see how it works, and it just will not happen. Um, um, let me just take you on to another part of the argument, and it's the constitutional argument, which Gordon Brown uh, raised the other day, and we'll come to that particular point in a second. Um, what you are saying, and you're trying to get the other parties under the umbrella of better together to agree to this, that uh, devolution will be maximised in some way, that there will be extra things offered, because you've discovered that that's what most people in Scotland appear, by opinion surveys, to want. What's quite interesting about that is that in 1997, the Blair government, of which you were a part, made the offer, the, the sort of Donald Dewar offer, as it were, it happened. Um, now, we know that PR was put into that on the assumption that that would stop the SNP ever being in power, and that failed. But you thought that that was what was needed to stop nationalism. You were wrong. Do you think you misjudged the Scottish people and that now they want more? Well, look, look there's two things you said there that I think are wrong. Um, you know, only two. <coughs> well, we've only just got yeah. going. Um, Firstly, the 1997 settlement, if you like, the Scotland Act, yes. was the product of collaboration on, um, outside the Labour Party with all the other parties except the SNP through the Constitutional Convention. Yes, yes. And that really went on from you know, the early, mid-1990s yes. up to up the time of the general election. And at that time, there was pretty much a consensus that what was in that settlement was right. Um, the other thing is just a, it's a footnote in history. I do remember discussing the PR point, and it was actually at that time, believe it or not, oh. we were worried about there being an absolute Labour majority. Oh, come on. It was. It was come I, on. I, I, was, I, I, I can't I, let you get but, away with well, that. Well, it happens to be true. P that's why. PR, um, <clears throat> PR is in there no, it because wasn't. it was assumed that the nationalists no, it, could be stopped honestly, by Jim, PR. We, we'll come, no doubt. Okay. We, one well, day come back to that. But, you know, okay. I'll just, well, no, no, no heckling at this point. You can get your chance yeah, later. You can do that. Right. Anyway, okay. Anyway, the point. The point is that there was, a set, there was a settlement there that was, there was right. general consensus. Okay. Since then, and though I don't remember any particular pressure to it, there have been further measures that have been devolved. Yes. The principal one, of course, is in relation to the Scotland Act of 2012. And why does no one know about that? What, I tell you, I th because there was a... When it went through Parliament, the Labour Party started it, the present government continued it. it 
the principal wasn't opposed. It got, I don't really remember seeing any coverage on the whole thing. But it's and extraordinary. It, it is extraordinary because my guess is if we all went out here tonight and we each stopped you know, 20 people somewhere in Glasgow and said, did you know that in 2016 the Scottish Parliament has to fix the Scottish rate of income tax? Did, how many you know, people in the hall uh, knew that? About a third. Well, and this is a very interested it, audience. You may, well, this may be the, you know, the height of your new knowledge tonight. But, um, yes. you know, the, it, the, the, the Scotland Act, which has passed, um, what, two years ago now, did, did you know, it is a number of smaller changes. But from uh, next year, the Scottish Government has total control over land taxes, which basically is stamp duty. And then from 2016, it will fix the Scottish rate of income tax. And all, all, everybody in this room, when you get your um, tax coding for the next year, will see um, the, uh, the letter S in front of your tax code, because that is where the revenue you've decided you now live, you know, for tax purposes. So that whatever happens in the future, you will be a Scottish taxpayer. But the difference between what happens now, as you know, the Scottish Parliament can raise or... Um, yes, or, or, uh, the 3%. Uh, the 3%, which actually no one has done because they've worked out it's not terribly popular to offer to put up taxes, you know, which is... Strange. Strange, but yeah. it's, it's, it's true. But from 2016, if they don't fix the rate, it, the position defaults so that they lose 10% of the revenue. So they've got to actually fix the rate. Now, I think that's important... Because I think one of the, you know, if you look back, what is the criticism of the devolutionary settlement is the Scottish Parliament has the power to spend money, but it never had the responsibility yeah. to raise it. And I can tell you from personal experience, it's dead easy to spend the stuff, yes. uh, but actually raising it tends to be deeply unpopular no matter where you happen to go. I want to talk a little bit about Europe. Um, it seems to me that um, Alex Salmond has got various um, very helpful figures in his. Um, kind of galère of stars. Leave Sean Connery out of it for the moment. Um, he obviously hopes that Boris Johnson decides to take a holiday in Scotland this summer and to talk to various media outlets as he wanders across the grouse moors. That would be extremely helpful. Um, the other person, it seems to me, that is in his sight as a very helpful figure is Mr Farage. Um, and I should t I'm, I'm going to tell this story. I told it to somebody earlier. I was walking down a road in Edinburgh, not unknown to you, the other day, uh, a few months ago anyway, and a man weaved out of licensed premises. And when I say weaved, I mean weaved. And he said, you have that man on the radio. And I said, well, there we are, can't deny it. And um, he said, I've got a question for you. The next time you've got that man from UKIP in your programme, I said, oh, well, I'm always interested in a good new question. And he said, you ask him this from me. He said, does he park his car in a garage or a garage? <laughs> <laughs> and he weaved off into the night. I thought it was rather a good question. I can't find a way of asking it somehow. But, but anyway, now look, Alex Salmond is going to say, when, when UKIP go, uh, go um, ballistic in the Euro elections in England, which they will, outside London anyway, um, Alex Hammond is going to say, look, across the border, they've gone crackers. They're nuts on Europe. Um, the biggest risk for Scotland's interests in Europe is that you stay in the UK and David Cameron is re-elected and you have an in-out referendum and it's out. Now, how do you answer that? Well, look, I, I'm, I'm sure you're right that um, Farage is perhaps a new friend of uh, Alex Hammond's. I don't know. Um, yeah, people expect them to do well. I think, though, when looking at UKIP's vote, we'd also do well to understand where it's coming from. And a lot of it is not so much Europe as other issues like immigration and so on. If you look at what they, you know, where, you know, where they're trying to, the to get support. But the effect of a vote for but, UKIP. But, yeah, UKIP will do well, but that sort of disaffected vote, a lot of it, the nationalists have hoovered up in, in Scotland. And you know, the UKIP will not do particularly well in Scotland because they don't really have much, uh, much of a presence here. But I think it's... I say two things here. One is it's a mistake to think that Scottish, Scottish attitudes are so profoundly different from the rest of the UK that somehow, you know, that they're, they're alien beings. If you What's look at your evidence well, for that? Well, the, well the, the most recent one is the Scottish Social Attitudes Survey published at the end of last year, yeah. which shows that if you ask people in Scotland what their views are in relation to the European Union, is not much difference between what people in Scotland think as to what people in the rest of the UK think. You think Scots are as sceptical... Yeah. I think there is a scepticism right across the UK. But the about tone is different. The, 
The tone well, is different, isn't it? You don't have UKIP, but you have got people in Scotland who are profoundly sceptical about aspects of the European Union. You've got people in Scotland, and let's just face up to it, who are also, well, if you ask them, they will have concerns about immigration, issues like the, the UKIP are raising. And what I don't buy into is this argument that Alex Salmond has been trying to run for some years now, that somehow Scotland and the rest of the UK, the, the attitudes, the culture are just totally different. Of course, there are differences, but the idea that it is so completely different that they're almost like a an alien nation is nonsense. Uh, and, you know, I just simply don't buy that argument. And equally, I think in relation to whatever happens in the European elections in the summertime, I think most people in Scotland will draw a distinction between what I fear is likely to be a low poll in the summer because people think, well, you know, Europe, does it really matter? What's, what's my MEP do and all the rest of it? Um, and, and, and something you know, where it's almost like a free vote. Yeah. And something that's going to happen in September where it is most certainly not a free vote for wherever you are in Scotland, it matters very, very precisely. Do you think it'll be a high vote in September? I very much hope so, because I well, think... Well, I know you hope it, but, well, I mean, will it be? Well, it's impossible to tell. No one... There's very few people around who will say, actually, I'm making a vote that I'm not going to vote. Um, but you, yes. don't, and you never know on the day how many people will come out and vote. I just say that whatever the result... If it was on a low poll, and the Scottish election polls have been, you know, in some cases, under 50%, yes. You know, that is going to cause real problems well, because you, your mandate has to come from having a decent turnout. Well, uh, what problems? I mean, this is a very intriguing area about division. What problems? Which is, I, I, look, from, from, I, you know, I said to you uh, right at the start, if you're a nationalist, you only have to win by one vote, and you, that's you, you're home and dry. From my point of view, we have to win well because what I would like, you know, people are going to have their say, but I hope that we can put to bed this issue of whether we break away to bed for a generation. It won't go away, it'll never go away for the, the, the reasons that you yes, mentioned yes. right your first, first question there. But what we can't do as a country is to spend endless years discussing constitutional questions when things like the state of our health, uh, our education, all the things that may actually make Scotland what it is and what it can be in the future are being pushed to one side because all the discourse, all the political debate, for most of my lifetime actually, but certainly in the last two years, have been all about this constitutional question. And an awful lot of what affects the quality of life for people in this room and throughout Scotland is actually not going to be affected by the constitution, it's going to be affected by our ability to spend the money and to make the reforms we need on you know, key services like you know, um, say the, the care of the elderly, the health service and education. I mean, what you're, what you're saying is that if it's, a, if it's a yes vote, obviously we go into a long period of negotiation, I mean that's clear, um, uh, and we'll come to that in a minute, but what you're saying is if it's a narrow no vote, you think that that's not the end of it. Well, it, 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 it's not a secret, this, because Alex Salmond's made it clear he'll come back next time, and the time after that, and the time after that. And what, what I, I, your question, the original question was, turnout, and I'm saying that for the good of Scotland, we need a decent turnout. I will do my level best to encourage people to turn out, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm sure others will too, uh, because you, it, it, you know, I think it, this is an issue that it's been talked about all my political life. This is in September, this is the time when we need to, need to make a decision and then, you know, whatever the result is, we abide by it, of course. Uh, but I think, you know, we really can't afford another five years not talking about the fact, for example, some of the health outcomes uh, and our life expectancy of older people in Scotland are some of the worst in Western Europe. Um, how do you get over the frustration of not having a debate with the First Minister? Well, I do find it frustrating. I, mean, I did actually have a sort of debate hit with him about in the 2005 uh, general election. So, you know, I, I, I remember... It's I remember, quite a long time it ago. Is, it, it is, uh, and I actually enjoy a debate. But I, what I find frustration is, you look at all the issues that are surfing, surfacing just now, whether it's currency, what would happen to us in relation to Europe, uh, what, if you take the, the, the Scottish government's own figures, I mean... You know, Salmon's been blaming, saying everybody else is wrong. This week he's saying even its own government figures are wrong and you shouldn't believe them and actually things are all right. I think it is absolutely necessary for us to have a debate. Well, the, television, the television debates, that threshold was crossed in the last general election when you had the leaders' debates. There is no reason on earth why we cannot have a debate between people who both got votes in Scotland and you know, both got different say, things to say about Scotland, both care passionately about the country in which they live. There's no reason why the two of us can't have a debate. 
Well, isn't he right to say that David Cameron does have a dog in this fight? You know, he made a speech uh, at the Olympic Park where he talked about his conviction about Scotland being part of the UK. He's going to be in Edinburgh tomorrow at the Scottish Conservative Party conference, and he'll talk about it quite rightly. George Osborne came up. William Hague has done things. So they are involved. I mean, they're bound to be involved. Of course they are, because there are consequences for the whole UK. Now, isn't Alex Hammond perfectly uh, right in saying, look, if they're involved in that sense, they're quite involved enough to stand up and face me. What's wrong with that argument? I, I understand he wants to pitch a Scotland-England fight. This is not what it's about. He was the one that said when the referendum was announced, remember at the beginning of 2012, that this issue will be decided in Scotland by people who live or on, uh, have a vote in Scotland. And he's right. You know, we all have a vote. Now, I can't see for the life of me why he's, not, why he's not willing to do that. I understand the politics of this because he does want it to be him against the Tories. So what's your you offer? Know, but, my offer is a televised debate, or given the number of channels we've got, more than one televised debate. No, steady but, on. Just a BBC well, debate. I'm well, <coughs> I, I, was, I was sticking up for the, uh, <laughs> okay, the wrong right. BBC right, side. Okay, of things, right. but, uh, no, no, come but, back. You know, do, do, do you know, I, I think people would just, given that we had the televised debates you know, in the last UK general election, we had the televised debates in the last Scottish election, and a thing like this, where we're deciding this country's future for maybe the next few hundred years, it would be very, very odd if we go to the polls without being any sort of debate uh, because he wouldn't take part in it. I, I just think it would be extraordinary. Um, presumably you would debate other people on his side of the argument, would you? Or would you take the view that I'll only debate the number one man? Well, I have. I had a, a, yes. a, a debate with um, Nicola Sturgeon twice, actually, in, in the, the last year right. or so. And, um, but, uh, you know, he's, he's the leader of their campaign. I lead this campaign. What's he got to be afraid of? Why doesn't he get on with it? Let me ask you something else, which is intriguing. Um, clearly, people outside Scotland don't have a vote on this, but they'll be affected by it. And they'll be affected by the negotiations that would follow a yes vote, um, which might be difficult, they might be easy, who knows. Um, what do you say to people who say, well, um, I know what I feel about the referendum, but then I want to check the result of the negotiation which follows it. Is there a case for saying, after the 18 months, which Mr. Salmon says it would take, um, you have another referendum to say, do you like well, the deal? Look, both sides, and I wasn't a party to this, no. but David Cameron yes. and Alex Salmon, when they signed the agreement in Edinburgh in 2012, mm. both sides said explicitly this, was going to, this, this referendum was going to decide yes. the issue. Yes. And I'm absolutely clear, having spent two and a half years on this, and this is longer than the Americans take to elect their president. This is a long, long debate. That this is deciding decision time. Uh, when we go to the polls, that will be the decision. Now, Salmon didn't ask for something different to that. He said, this is a question to be put to the Scottish people. No ifs or buts. If he wins by one vote, he's won. Uh, you know, that, that, that's, that's the end of the matter. This is the only referendum. And we've got to decide. Uh, but those were the terms and conditions that he signed up to, both sides signed up to, in Edinburgh a couple of years ago. Effectively, you were saying it's <coughs> helpful to you that there isn't a judgment on the negotiation after a potential yes vote, because it's more useful for you to say you don't know what's going to come up later. No, I, I'm just saying to you that, uh, we know, as you know, as you, I think you said at the start, after 2010, I was happily sitting on the back benches. You know, I wasn't going to re-enter. Happily but, might not be the, the well, word, I, I but anyway. Happy. OK, um, right. I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't going to re-enter re the fray. The referendum, the nationalists won on a mandate, amongst other things, to have uh, yes. a referendum. They got an agreement with the UK government that this was the referendum they wanted. Now, you can't go around changing the rules now and say, well, actually, it doesn't look too good for them, so they'll therefore change the rules. I'm happy to fight by the rules that we've been set. Those are the rules. This is the referendum. Don't let anyone kid themselves by saying, well, let's have a punt in it or let's see. This is the referendum. And believe, take this, if the nationalists win by one vote, do you think for one minute Alex Salmon's going to say, well, actually, I didn't really mean that and, uh, you know, we can come back and discuss it? Uh, you know, after the 2011 elections, he, you know, we were told the week before elections it wasn't about independence. The day afterwards, apparently, it was about nothing but. Um, Gordon Brown uh, talked this week about... Um, you know, constitutional discussions after the vote. Um, <clears throat> why should people believe what 
the various parties involved in your campaign say about what will happen after the vote, given that you know, they've seen you in office and you didn't offer any of this, now in a panic, in a vote up to the referendum, you're suddenly saying, oh, we can give you more. We can do this, we can do that, all sorts of things. It'll be fine. Gordon Brown, who's got no office at all, who's a you know, distinguished man, uh, still an MP, former Prime Minister, comes up and says, oh, it'll be fine. We'll have this great constitutional convention or something like that. Ming Campbell says the same. Why should people believe that this is going to happen? What's your offer? Well, for better together is not a political party. We're no, not, I, not standing in the general election, no. and I've always made it clear. Well, that's a nice that the, the offer, wiggle room. Well, it isn't, yes. because, I mean, you know, better together will be wound up yes. in 12 yes. months' time. We, yes. you know, we just won't be here. And, and it's up to the political parties, and the, you know, right. the, um, the Liberals have set out their stall. The Labour Party will do so in its uh, Scottish conference um, in a couple of weeks' yes. time, and the Tories sometime uh, you know, a, couple, a few weeks after that. The, but what, what, I, what I disputed is what you said at the first place. The, we, it was us, through the Constitutional Convention, that introduced the yes. present Scotland Act. Uh, and that was, if you like, pressure over 20 years or so. You know, it was a long time yes. in the making, but there it was. It was the nationalists who walked out of that constitution because they said it was a, a fudge, they didn't want anything to do with it. Also, as I said, the last Labour government introduced the legislation or started the process to make the tax changes yes, we were talking about. The, Scotland Act. the present uh, uh, coalition government has implemented it. And you know, it, it's always been the case that you know, people have said devolution is a, you know, if you like, a, a, a gradual process. But there's a world of difference between devolution and independence, which are a completely different concept because it's no longer then you know, sharing the risks, pooling resources and so on, it's a completely different separation. So, you know, um, I, you know I, I think, you know, if the, the result of the referendum is on my side, if you like, I haven't the slightest doubt that the, whatever parties or, part, you know, party forms the government in the next election, uh, they will have to honour the promises they make. But you have a problem, don't you? <coughs> because if you look at a lot of Labour voters in Scotland, and you say to them, you may be tempted by what Alex Salmond says, <coughs> one cross in the box, no more nasty Tories, no more David Cameron, no more George Osborne, no more old Etonians. And they may say, thank you very much. And they say, yeah, don't worry, Ed Miliband will be along in a moment. And they look at you and they say, he's a man from Mars. Well, I'm not sure that, actually, and I, obviously I don't agree with you in relation to that. Well, you know, I'm not I, I think stressing a view. I'm just, I, you know, I, I, I'm being the BBC, of course you're just yes, expressing yes, yes, a view. Yes, yes, yeah. um, um, yes. It's a problem but, for you. But, but, if you. If you uh, look at many people who voted Labour, not just who voted Labour as well, the things that they are bothered about are the job prospects. They're bothered about the standard of living. Do you think he can solve them? They've got far more faith in a Labour government than they will ever have of the Tory government. Look, I, 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 I'm happy to work with the, 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 the three political parties, two of which I don't agree with and who stand against me every single election because I happen to agree in relation to Scotland being better as part of the UK and if we ever have a referendum in Europe, I dare say there'll be a cross-party alliance then and people actually do like people when they agree to work yeah, together. Yeah. But I have profound disagreement with the Tories and the Liberals on housing policy, on what they're doing in education, and what they're doing uh, in, in, in terms of uh, improving people's chances and standard of living. What I, what I do think, though, for anyone who believes like me in those values, to get yourself into a constitutional arrangement where, like we've seen this week, you suddenly find you simply do not have the money to do the things you want because the oil price went down, there's less exploration. That is madness to get yourself into that situation. Surely what we want is to have a situation where we can spend the money we need, devote the resources necessary to make this country more fair and more just than it is at the present time, but you can do that far better with the strength of the UK. But yes, you know, after this referendum is finished, I'll be campaigning for the election of a Labour government next year because I think that, in 2015, because that is what I think is best for the United Kingdom, best for Scotland. Are you enjoying this? I mean, not this, but I mean this. Well, this is all right so far. No, no, no. Yeah, but I mean, no, um, but I mean, I mean, well, it's quite a thing, isn't it? It, um, you know, if um, uh, you know, I'm tempted to say that a law should be passed saying you should never have a two and a half year election campaign mm. ever again because it, it never mind the people taking part of it. From the public's point of view, you know, most members of the public can just about take four weeks of an election campaign, uh, but two and a half years—it's a long, long time. Uh, the good thing is, I think people are becoming more focused now. They can see 18th September as a date you can have in front of your mind. 
Um, but, um, you know, like What's all elections, uh, anything at the ballot box, those who take part in it should be profoundly nervous right up until uh, the ballot closes at 10 o'clock in the evening of September the 18th. I ask you to go off and take your concerns, your angst, and your enthusiasm with you on whichever side you happen to be, and to thank, on behalf of you all, Alistair Darling for being with us. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.